Hi there. My name is Aaron Landerman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And in a couple of the previous lectures of guitar amplification and effects, we've looked at the power amplifier and the Fender Champ amplifier. We looked at the biasing, and we also did some large signal analysis to determine the amount of power delivered to the speaker. In this lecture, we're going to perform a small signal analysis and take a look at some characteristic curves of pentodes, although technically here beam tetrodes along the way. To clarify, I'm performing a small signal analysis of power tubes, not a small signal analysis of a so-called small signal tube like the EF86, whose goal is to create voltage gain in a preamplifier circuit. It's a little confusing because there's two different uses of the term small signal floating around. In particular, we've been focusing on the 5E1 version of the Fender Champ. Assuming that we can approximate the capacitors here as shorts, as far as the signal goes, we can take this part of the circuit here, the power amplifier, and redraw it like this, where I decompose the circuit into its DC bias and small signal aspects. We've previously looked at the DC biasing, and in this lecture, we'll compute the small signal gain. Throughout this course, we've been using a small signal model for triodes that consists of a voltage-controlled voltage source in series with a dynamic plate resistance. This has the feel of a Thevenin equivalent, but we could do a source transformation on the circuit and rewrite it in this Norton style consisting of a voltage-controlled current source in parallel with the dynamic plate resistance. We preferred to use the version of the right using mu because mu is pretty consistent over a wide range of operating parameters for triodes, and it's fairly consistent from tube to tube. In contrast, if you look at the curves associated with pentodes or beam tetrodes, for instance, this graph from the 6v6 datasheet, we see that the curves are fairly flat when you look at the plate current versus the plate voltage. This is a fairly small slope in comparison with what we saw with triodes, and the dynamic plate resistance RP is the reciprocal of this slope. So RP is pretty big, so we can think about the pentode as well approximating a current source, which suggests that we use this Norton-style approach to describing pentodes. Now, you can do all of the derivations I'm about to do using this version with mu, but mu changes with the operating characteristics, whereas gm is more consistent. So the transconductance gm is going to play the role for pentodes that mu played for triodes in terms of being our main parameter of interest. Notice that I did not write I sub k down here in terms of what the cathode current is because there's also the screen current. But as far as figuring out what the gain of the tube is, we only really care what's happening looking down this direction. We only really care about the plate current. So generally, I haven't seen any textbooks that explicitly include the screen current in this kind of diagram. Now, we probably would have to worry about some of that if the cathode was partially bypassed. But fortunately, in all of the power amplifier schematics I've seen, the cathode is always fully bypassed, so the cathode is held at ground in the small signal circuit. So we can replace the pentode with our Norton-style model here, and we see that we have a current source in parallel with RP. ZRF here represents the impedance of the speaker as seen reflected through the output transformer. And so then this plate current is essentially split between RP and ZRF. So there's a couple of ways of thinking about this that each of which provides a different insight. One way to think about it is to say, okay, well, we have a current GM times VN that I've written here, and then I can write down a current division equation. So we have the impedance is RP plus ZRF in the denominator. And I'm used to using voltage dividers, so I have to remember that when we have a current divider, say here to figure out the current through ZRF, you put in the numerator the other resistance. So we put RP in the numerator. So this will give us our current IP. 
I want to turn that back into a voltage, so I need to multiply it by this impedance ZRF according to Ohm's law. And in terms of this minus sign here, I can figure out that I need a minus sign there by noting that the current is being pulled out of the node. Another way to approach it is just to say, well, of course I have one impedance to an AC ground, I have another impedance to a real ground, the circuit doesn't care, and so I can just say, well, I have a current going through ZREF in parallel with RP. And of course, this expression here is just RP and ZREF in parallel. So I need to figure out what GM is and what RP is. Now, most data sheets will give some nominal GM and RP values for some nominal operating conditions. So here we have transconductances of 3700, 4100, and 3750 for the cases where the screen and plate voltage are 180, where they're both 250, and this oddball case here where the plate voltage is 315, but the screen voltage is 225. Quite often, you just pick the scenario closest to your actual circuit. So in this case, that would be 4100 micromoles or 4.1 millimoles. Similarly, we can look up the plate resistance, and for these first two scenarios, that's 50K, and for this scenario on the end here, that would be 80K. And the closest operating conditions to our operating conditions would suggest we use 50K. But that's kind of boring. I thought it might be educational and more fun to try to estimate RP and GM from the curves on the data sheet. So this is a graph from the general electric version of the 6V6 data sheet. And here we have the grid to cathode voltage, and I should clarify the control grid to cathode voltage plotted along the horizontal axis and the plate current along the vertical axis. And here we have a bunch of lines associated for different screen to cathode voltages. Right now, I just want to mention as an aside that these points also appear on this kind of graph. Now, on this kind of graph, the grid to cathode voltage is along the horizontal axis. On this kind of graph, the grid to cathode voltage is associated with these different lines. This graph here is for a 250 volt plate to cathode voltage. Remember, our, our actual plate to cathode voltage is 286 volts. I'll come back to that point. The thing I want to note here is that this 250 volts corresponds to this 250 volt line here. Now, I could approximate transconductances using curves like this by approximating slopes of these curves, and I would be tempted to use the screen to cathode voltage of 250 volts. But remember, our screen to cathode voltage is actually 286 volts. And in a previous lecture, we found a way of extrapolating our curves to other screen to cathode voltages using this weird formula. Now, in a previous application of this formula, we used a grid to cathode voltage of zero volts. That's not the case here. Here we have a whole bunch of grid to cathode voltages we might want to be worrying about, so we'll need to actually explicitly include this. The overall idea is still the same. Let me divide the left and right sides here by this quantity in parentheses to the 3 halves power. So then I see I have this current over this business with the voltages equals some constant, and I can equate a bunch of expressions like this for different quantities, knowing that they'll all be equal to each other. In particular, I can plug in 286 or 250 volts for VSK to get the currents associated with those voltages for whatever VGKs I want to plug in here. Now, I'm going to make an assumption, it's the same assumption I made in a previous lecture, that the plate and the screen currents scale equivalently so I could replace the subscript Ks with subscript Ps. Now I have an expression for the plate voltage for the 286 volt screen to cathode case from the data associated with the 250 volt screen to cathode case. But to use this formula, I need to estimate mu sub s.
For that, I can use data from this graph, and a particularly useful set of points are those associated with the plate current equals zero line, namely the horizontal axis. If the plate current is zero, the screen current is zero, and the cathode current is zero, so everything on the left turns into a big zero, and zero to the two-thirds power, to get rid of this over here, is also zero, so I can then solve the resulting equation and estimate mu s as minus a screen to cathode voltage over a grid to cathode voltage on that IP equals zero horizontal axis line. So looking for such a point here, we'll take our 250 volt line as something closest to our 286 volts for the screen to cathode voltage. And if I trace that this direction, well, it probably keeps going a bit this way, but for my sanity, I'm going to cut it off here at minus 34 volts. So 250 over minus 34 with that minus sign in front gives me 7.35 as my estimate of mu s. So I need some points to plug into this formula. I took these points on the 250 volt screen to cathode curve, and I plugged those into Excel. Now, these points are for the 250 volt plate to cathode condition. We'll come back to that point. So I took these values, including the value for the grid to cathode equals zero volt line, and plugged those into Excel to compute that formula I showed you earlier. And I wound up with these numbers, which I then plotted on the graph to come up with this extrapolated curve for the screen to cathode voltage of 286 volts. Now, I need to compute the transconductance associated with the grid to cathode bias voltage. So for that, we need to go to a previous lecture where we determined that the grid to cathode bias voltage was minus 19 volts, although you could see that right away from the schematic where I wrote a 19 here, and that's written in on the original Fender Champ schematic. So I would like to estimate the transconductance associated with a grid to cathode voltage of minus 19 volts. So I pick three volts one direction and three volts the other direction for minus 16 and minus 22 volts. I read off the appropriate plate currents for those values. So I could estimate the transconductance by taking these finite differences. I have minus 16 volts minus minus 22 volts in the denominator, which would give me six volts. And then in the numerator here, I read off values of 45.9 and 23.4 milliamps, giving me 22.5 milliamps in the numerator, giving me an estimate of 3.75 millimoles. I took those values of 20 milliamps and 36 milliamps and plug them into these expressions that include these minus 15 and minus 20 volt figures. And computing this out, I got some numbers that when I try to compute the transconductance using these numbers, gives me something more like 3.88 millimoles, which is pretty close to that 3.75 I computed earlier. I kind of like the level of precision I was able to read off that earlier graph, so I'm going to use this 3.75 millimo figure. And if I were to compare that with the kinds of transconductances we see on the data sheet for these different scenarios, we see that it's more or less in the ballpark. So what about the plate resistance? Well, the curves here are so flat, it's kind of hard to get any sort of meaningful measurements. Let's pick the grid to cathode voltage line of minus 20 volts and explore that. If I were to say, look at the 21 milliamp and the 19 milliamp line and try to see where, say, the 21 milliamp line intersected, well, there's actually a big range of voltages because it's kind of flat. I don't know, let's say 400 volts just to have something to say, I guess. Okay, so what about the 19 milliamp? Drawing a line over from the 19 milliamp mark, maybe it intersects something like 200 volts? It's hard to say. So how about 200 volts over 2 milliamp giving me 100 kilo ohm? But I'm not particularly convinced that any of what I've read off of here is meaningful. Let's go with it anyway.
But remember, this was for a screen to cathode voltage of 250 volts, and we do have this scaling technique. So what if I were to scale these currents using a formula appropriate for the minus 19 volt bias grid to cathode voltage that we're focusing on? Plugging things into this formula gives me a number of 1.5, but the current was in the denominator, so let me take my estimate of 100 kilo ohm and divide it by 1.5. That would give me 67 kilo ohm, but again, I'm not terribly convinced of this. I think mostly what I'm showing here is that what I'm doing is a bad idea. Anyway, we estimated 67 kilo ohm, and if we look at the plate resistances for these different scenarios, we have 50K and 80K, so we're generally in the ballpark. So that was about as exciting as a drive through the cornfields of Illinois. Let's go ahead and take these numbers and plug them into our formula for the small signal gain. So plugging in 3.75 micromoles for our transconductance, 8.2 kilo ohm, which is the 4 ohm speaker impedance as seen through the transformer in parallel with our P, which we estimated to be 67 kilo ohm. And notice the 8.2 kilo ohm is so much smaller than the 67 kilo ohm that it's not much different. We wind up with 7.3 kilo ohm. So that gives us an inverting gain of 27.4. Now, what if I ignored the plate resistance and I just assumed it was infinite? Well, then I would wind up with a gain figure of 30.8, which isn't much different from 27.4. So the good news concerning all the difficulty we went through trying to estimate RP is that it doesn't really much matter as long as it's some big number. Now, this is the voltage gain on the tube side. What about the voltage gain as seen by the speaker? Well, I could take this gain value, divide it by the turns ratio of the transformer. This is something we determined in a previous lecture to be 45.3. And that gives me 0.6. So that's a voltage gain of less than one. But remember, the whole point of the circuit is not to have voltage gain, it's to push power to the speaker. And power is a combination of voltage and current. And our goal with matching the impedances is to get that magical combination to maximize that power transfer. And to put things into perspective, remember that the large signal gain we computed in a previous lecture was just 14. The way you can think about it is that if you're playing your guitar kind of lightly, well, then you have this full voltage gain of 27.4, at least as seen on the tube side. But you do wind up hitting a limit in terms of how far you can push the speaker if you're playing more heavily. And if you think about the gain limit from that standpoint, it's smaller. Essentially, the small signal gain doesn't know anything about the extreme limits of what the tube circuit can pull off.